Okay, so last time up here, make this smaller so you guys don't see what's coming. Right? No, it's not gonna happen. There it is. Not gonna do it. All right, well, now you're gonna see what's going. What are you trying to do? Make this smaller, but it won't do it. I don't know. Oh, that's my problem. Hey, didn't Not responding. I'm way. No, no, it's just my computer is a hand me down. That's why I got speakers because, well, it's a hand me down. <laughs> so we're gonna be, we're gonna be cursed. We're gonna be uh, buffering here, and I'm going off of. It. So it's okay. It's all right. So when I was trying to get here last time, um, and I wanted to go over the uh, uh, the holiness. We're going to cover that as soon as it stops buffering. You're killing me. You're killing me. There's more than now. My new goal is to make this book just as much as you know what this is now. Okay, well, well, there we are. Yeah, I'm <laughs> hold on, guys. So, we're going to make this class free. I tell you what, man, I am, I'm getting, I'd rather just have a pad of paper and tell you stuff. Was it like third time in a row that we're going for Chris trying to work on the computer and things going on, <laughs> going awry? Right, it's man. destroying me. My father in law says I've been that funny. <laughs> okay, you're going to do this? Yeah, dude. Okay, so now we go back to here. Right there. Sure. Systematic. Systematic. System mode. Okay, we doing this now? Huh? What? It looks like it now. Oh, we've been recording this whole time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is such a tech master. All right, I'm just hoping that this right here. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna hope that that's gonna shoot up there real quick. All right, so last time uh, I was trying to get down here to uh, get to you guys and talk about the holiness of God. Okay, we're gonna what we're doing right now is describing uh, who God is. All right. And, Oh, um, incommunicable is uh, gives starts off with yeah, incommunicable, yeah, attributes right here. It starts here and it goes the next few chapters. So, um, when we were describing this, who God is, we I want to make a qualifier before we go on. And I, the holiness of God is an awesome qualifier. Okay, to understand that he is set beyond, that he is, don't mess with me. Okay, that he's separate and distinct. Okay, we're going to go, Schneider, if you haven't watched the video, Schneider has a very, um, he presents the holiness of God very well. Um, the way he puts it in from Old Testament to New Testament. But to understand this real quick, that that the secondary meaning, and this follows on who we are as well, but the secondary meaning of the holiness of God is the purity. That just is a natural thing that comes from it. But it's, it is 
distinct, separate, different, that it, it, taking something to common and making it uncommon, this is, this is what he does to us, making something ordinary, making it extraordinary. God, when we're, we're talking about exegesis and exegesis here again, but we're going to go with that again, but when we're properly interpreting the Bible, like uh, like Caesar did last week, he was expounding and showing you what scripture says, what the holiness is. What you need to know? Uh, just, sorry. No, no, I'm good. The phone wire right there. So, no, that's weird, so. so when we're talking about the holiness of God, and Schneider does a, how do I get that thing down? You're killing me, people. Because now I need to do this, but I can't do it because this thing is in my way. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time. Oh my gosh, you're killing me. Uh, you're trying to get rid of that bar? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So we're going to watch seven minutes, hopefully. In our last, and this is a very brief section, on the name. Okay, so he's going to be talking about the holiness of God from the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's going to expect show you why it is very good qualifier. So when we're thinking of the attributes of God, we're not just thinking of uh, the transcendent God, the infinite God. What we're thinking of is his, him in a totality, not just this infinite but person. But there's a qualifier. The qualifier is his holiness. His holiness means a holy righteousness, holy uh, justice, holy wrath. All these things are, it's a beautiful qualifier. And when we start thinking and we question, people question to us and we're supposed to defend, we can come out with a little bit of better understanding and convey that holiness of God to them. So listen you to say qualifier, that's our starting point. Right? Starting point. Yeah. It is a very it's not just it's not just an attribute. And he'll explain right here, it's not just an attribute, it is a it is a uh, the nature of the nature of nature of God. Uh, we're gonna talk about the holiness of God. And uh, in the process, uh, I think hopefully you'll see why I include the holiness of God, not in the attributes section of the attributes of God. But in a broader discussion of the nature of God, God's personal, God's spirit, uh, God's a trinity, and God is holy. So let's talk about holiness. Um, in order to do this, we have to look. Uh, I, I don't do this a whole lot in a systematic theology class where we where we actually trace a Hebrew or Greek word. Um, I, I'm going to give you some summary information about it, but it's a it really is a helpful study for you to do. <clears throat> uh, if you're going to do a study or maybe uh, teach or preach a series on the holiness of God, then you'll be, you'll be forced into doing this kind of study. It's very helpful uh, in, in uh, I think, opening up your understanding of the biblical presentation of God. In the Old Testament, uh, the word kadash or kodesh in the noun form is uh, a word that is used many, many times to refer to, uh, to God. In its ancient Near Eastern background, and th th this word has cognates in other ancient Semitic languages, uh, but in the ancient Near Eastern background, the word is used often to refer to that which is of the divine as opposed to the human realm. Okay, so this is not a Christian word, obviously this is Hebrew, and this is not specifically a Jewish word, a Jewish religious word. Okay, this is a Semitic word, a concept that existed in the Semitic uh, world to uh, refer to the realm of the gods as opposed to the realm of human beings. And as the, well, in, in NIDA, there was a very helpful article on this word group. The noun form, Kodesh, connotes the essential nature that belongs to the sphere of God's being or activity and that is distinct from the common or profane. That's how the concept is used in the Old Testament. The essential nature that belongs to the sphere of God's being or activity and that is distinct from the common or the profane. Even in pagan religions of that world, you, you have reference to the holy gods, even though the gods were, were not, uh, did not engage in righteous behavior. Okay? So we can't automatically, as tends to be our... Uh, uh, our, our knee-jerk reaction, to associate the concept of holiness directly with moral purity or with righteous behavior. The idea of holiness is rooted 
in the concept of separation. We can illustrate this from Leviticus 10.10, where the law says, the Torah says, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. You can uh, see how this, uh, even in English, you can see how this contains a chiastic structure with common and unclean in the center, holy and clean on the outside of the, uh, of the chiasm. So there's an emphasis there on the distinction between, the contrast between that which is common and unclean and that which is holy and clean. So holy and clean are directly parallel concepts here. So holy means set apart. And when applied, obviously, in a religious context, it means that which is uh, that which belongs to God or belongs somehow to the divine realm as opposed to the human realm. That's how holiness is in the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? We have hagias or hagiazo in Greek in the New Testament. And uh, we have here the quality possessed by things and persons that could approach a divinity. So the emphasis is a little more on the earthly realm, but it's on that which in that which in the earthly realm is qualified to approach the divine. You understand? So that still carries over the idea from the Old Testament that there's an idea of separation, an idea of otherness or difference that's bound up with the concept of holiness. Frequently in the Old Testament, you have this, uh, the idea of holy unto the Lord. And if when something has been established as being holy unto the Lord, it has to be treated differently. It has to be treated as sacred. One of the most amazing stories to me in the Old Testament is uh, the story of Korah's rebellion. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Remember those guys? Uh, they decided that Moses and Aaron, well, basically, they decided they wanted democracy. They wanted Israel to be like California, where everybody could, you know, if they, they, they could, you know, start a referendum on anything. Everybody was on the same level playing field. Bring it up for a vote. Everybody gets a vote. And so they said, why, why should you be the only priests? We're God's people, too, so we should be priests also. And they made themselves um, incense according to the recipe for, for the incense of the tabernacle. And they made incense burners, censers. And they said, we're going we're gonna to be priests. And Moses gets all upset, and he goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what are we going to do? And, Lord's, and the Lord says, okay, they want to be priests. Tell them to go out there and... And, and offer incense and see how it works out for them. <laughs> but by the way, Moses, you might want to back everybody away. Oh. And so they go out there and they, there's a couple hundred of them. They offer their incense. Uh, God creates an earthquake, opens up the ground and swallows them, and then fire from heaven comes and consumes the rest of them. And afterward, I mean, there's not, I, I don't want to be snide about it, but afterward, there's nothing left but the censers they were holding in their hand. Ashes and these bronze censers, that's all that's left. Mm. And the thing about it is they, uh, Moses said, go and pick up those censers and take them to the tabernacle. They were burning holy incense, and therefore those censers are holy. They were set apart, even though they were being used by evil men. They were holy unto the Lord. And so they were taken away and flattened out and, and fashioned into uh, shields that were used in the, in the tabernacle. So holy is a quality that is uh, possessed by an earthly thing or person that is qualified to approach God, to approach a deity. And that idea carries forward into 
the uh, New Testament. And then, of course, I won't go to these passages, uh, but in the New Testament, Father, Son, and Spirit are all referred to as holy. So the holiness of God in the Old and New Testaments is reinforced throughout. And, of course, holy is actually part of the, the name of the third member of the Trinity, Holy Spirit. So we understand, you see where he's getting with this, it's where I'm going with this. When we understand who God is, okay, we understand that um, Caesar does this in a video, it's called the God Why Evil. Um, it's a, it's a two, two hour uh, a venture into asking the question why why there is evil if it's a loving God. And scripture talks about over and over again that his ways are not our ways, okay, it is part of his. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Okay? They are other. See, this what he was saying right there is what I was trying to get at when we were last time is that not only is this the beginning, this process is being now imputed. Have you ever heard that word imputed? It's been imputed onto us as the as the cisterns are presented as a uh, even though they were used by corrupt people, were used to, to be approached. Before God, it's the same thing that with our corrupt bodies, with imputed holiness from Christ Himself. Mm. See, okay. okay, see what I'm saying? He, he, him being other, transcendent, he makes it personal and he brings it down. And when you're sitting around a room, and or you go into when I was at the mission, and men would just you go into a room. And I'm not boasting. I'm just saying I I got upset over it. Man, when people would stop cussing around me because I'm like, you know, I could be paranoid anyway. I was getting off dope, so. You know, we're talking about, you know, a little paranoid, but but then I started understanding what was going on. Is that is that is that blessing that God gives you to you through it? And what Cedar did last week is I I'm not much of the expository when it comes to this. This thing is kind of too drive me crazy. Ah, ah, ah. Huh. now I don't have to worry about it, homeboy. Yeah. Oh, you little turd is down there now. Come on, up here. Ah, good. That's what I'm talking. We're going to figure this out. Okay. So, but with all this said, with all that said, I know I should put a couple. Of when we, we start understanding the holiness of God, we got to what Stephen did last week is he, he went through and he expounded on it. And he went through each, each of the scriptures that talks about soul, the holiness. And it's not just your whole. This is a process, just like it's a sanctification. This is a growing in 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 with the in with Christ. This so when we understand, it's just it's not just instant, man. It, but it, it is an evolution. It is a a, a growing with Him. We have got to make sure that we come at the proper interpretation and understand that what exegesis and eisegesis he he uh he hooked on that last week, and we're gonna go through it. We're gonna go for it. Buddy. Well, I was just thinking, for some reason, I was, th I was thinking of the um, verse that says, um, come boldly before the throne of grace. And then I also thought of a song where it says, take me into the holy of holies, take me in by the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> Amen. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> See, we, I didn't expand on it again, but this is what, this is what Exodus, he gave you three points. The three things that we need to understand when we do proper interpretation. Remember, Exodus is reading from scripture. I said Jesus is reading into scripture. Okay. And so we're going to we'll go over. I'll give you the definitions. They'll be up here again. So, but anyways, there's three things, a three step process when we do a proper interpretation. He, he hit on it last weekend. <clears throat> and that, or last, last Monday. Context, context, context. Okay. Somebody was talking about um, when you memory verses. You guys said one of them is therefore, and yeah. I think it was Dave was was it Dave who was saying it? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was saying so, yeah. it. And he was he was trying to you know there's a therefore reason. I urge yeah. you brothers, uh, I beseech you brothers by yeah, yeah you're talking about uh, uh, Romans twelve right yes yes yeah, Romans yeah. twelve one two yes but there's a reason no why way. yeah therefore is therefore for a reason so always when therefore is there figure out why therefore is therefore okay so there's a reason why. Prior to that, um, so that is another purpose statement. So that, that so that, it, it shows it in uh, James, is another one, James chapter one. So that, this is what you do. 
Context, context, context. And I'm going to add one more thing to this. He said, you guys are going to get in hermeneutics next, proper interpretation. He said last week, historical, grammatical, uh, literal, and geographical. It's, it's also another... Uh, grammatical, literatical, literal, I and mean, geographical is another one. That, yeah. Geographical is one, because if, think um, about um, Revelation 3.16, and I will vomit you out. Like You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were. I wish you were. If you actually do your hermeneutical background, there's a reason why he says it like that. Did you know that the, from the north there was Los uh, Lodicea, Cidia? It was. I, can, I know. I'm butchering. Laodicea. Yeah, there. Excellent. It was a uh, very wealthy uh, area, and they they made these uh, bombs for healing. They were making these bombs for healing, right? And so it was a very wealthy uh, agriculture. We're very wealthy at a hospital or a big medical university. Well, anyways, they aqueduct water from the hot springs up north. And they brought water from down south from the, the mountains. And by the time they got to the place, they were lukewarm. And by the time they got to the place, the aqueducts would scale up and leave all these, these uh, deposits and eventually made you sick as a dog so you would vomit up so just to get that that geographical is an actual yeah it's another one too yeah so i didn't have the geographical one. Um, i'm sure he's gonna he's so, gonna so you say that again with the exegesis is reading from scripture here, here. Exegesis is... right here okay you you lead out they actually translate exegesis actually translate to lead out we are to take from read out of scripture according with the author's intent meaning and when he said that last week, uh, just think about that. Certain scriptures I do read into those scriptures, not reading out. Amen. 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 Yeah. Since he said that, I've been noticing. What well, see, that is a beautiful uh, testimony right there, though, because when we start understanding that there's preachers that stand up by the pulpit and do the same thing. Yeah. And they do the same thing every time. They they're not they're not because. For whatever, and I'm not saying an agenda, maybe just a uh, lack of schooling, maybe just a uh, um, just to be whatever the reason. I'm not trying to disrespect anybody. Yeah. But um, um, Seaford and Chappie they ruined me. So I'm just getting. I'm serious, dude. When you start seeing these things and you start seeing preachers preach it like a certain way, and you just go, that's not right. <laughs> it's not properly, you know. And you just start getting. You just get ruined because. Then you start really seeing that, then putting their own perspectives, their own uh, 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 agendas, and all this other things. And then you start seeing what theologies, different theologies, the open theists, where they're, they're saying that uh, um, God doesn't know everything, and that's why people are suffering right now. And then there's there's uh, there's uh, progressive theists that uh, are dismantling the old truths of the Bible and putting together according to man these are and then the love theology of bethel and stuff like that where they actually start they they, they twist that word love uh, to put it to their own way to their own will and you start seeing all these different ways you know and there's a lot of them out there and so i said jesus you just stop doing that up here all right and i said jesus is putting into scripture interpreting scripture in such a way that it introduces a person's perceptual agendas and biases. You do not curtail theology according to who you are. You do not do it. Okay. Okay. You curtail theology according to what he says. We bring it out. We we don't put it in. He has. I mean, when you get into hermeneutics and you start understanding how to do Palm Sunday this next this uh the tenth, I get to do the honor of. Uh, talking about the triumph of entry. Did you know that that actually began back in Genesis? It, just the image of the Lion of Judah riding on a colt. Genesis 49. It is, it is just amazing that, yeah, that Jacob's blessing his children. But you start, you start seeing that it's just not, it's just not this verse right here. In the totality of it all, it's, it's from the very beginning of it. It's from the very beginning of it. He's going so, for Genesis 49. <laughs> I think he's yeah, now he's going to. So it's so just so, so. I'm clear. So I mean, these are these are really clear. No, please. 
but I want to like, because what you were talking about earlier before class started, we were talking about uh, uh, putting your own personality. But what you're talking about in that sense is you're just using the gifts that God has given you um, in your experience in life to prove something that's already in the yeah. Bible. Yeah. Or not, not prove something. And there's the balance. Illustrate something that's yes. already the truth of the Bible, right? Praise Versus God. Yeah. Well, see, put your own. Because you can get up there and you could be electric and, you know, and just get people emotionally enthralled and be absolutely, utterly wrong and disrespect and dishonor God. But when God starts, what's, what's our main goal in Christianity on this side of the cross, on, on this side, is, is Christ-like behavior. Okay, now that is the whole gambit of it. But when we start understanding that he's Fall sending you his purpose, your experiences, your experiences, his experiences, my experiences, and that comes across in whatever loving way that God deems to use our personality and conveying his truth, his truth. Yeah, and see, yeah, there's the balance because I can, I can get up there and I can uh, kind of find out I'm a bit of a bully, even though I'm off drugs, you know, but uh, you know. <laughs> I can get up there and start bragging on people, but that doesn't get anybody closer to the truth. But if I get up there and I start being personable about it and uh, expound it, telling them what I found through scripture and what God has revealed to me, it comes across with my personality, but God's truth. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful relationship. You got it, Gavin? Um, Go for it, man. I swear, I, I don't know how to get that down. Just trying to create. Ah! <laughs> yeah! It's up at top. <laughs> yeah! Okay, so we're going to go back. Tell me when you guys are done. We might go, I might have to draw this quick. So, but, and again, what's his name? Um, Dr. Schneider. You're good to go. All right, brother, man. So Dr. Schneider does it again here. Now I can put this back in the middle. There we go. All right. It's up there now. <laughs> in our last in hold on, hold on. Uh, so we're going to 26. So 26. 26. Uh, uh, okay. What he puts here is a bit, he doesn't say eisegesis or as exegetic, but I want you to try our I want you to try to hear what he's saying when he's talking about people interpreting and how they're doing it. Okay. Yeah, God is not a democracy. It's going to start for about 20 seconds. Um, I mean, not even democracy works that way. So anyway, we, we tend to impose our ideas of what good it is and impose those on God. So that's definitely a big potential pitfall. Okay. So, how do we think about it then? How, how should we think about this? <clears throat> the, the two ways that we just looked at are not, are, are not fundamentally wrong-headed, you understand. Uh, God communicates, God reveals himself to us in categories that we understand, in categories that relate to us. I mean, God has revealed virtue to us, and we understand it to be good, and therefore we ascribe it to God. That's all good. We have to be careful about placing the priority on the creature discovering the creator. That's my main concern here. We want to be careful of, a cre of the creature reasoning toward his creator. And if you read some of the older systematic theologies of the modernist era, Okay, again, some of my otherwise favorite theologies of the 19th century, uh, whether Calvinist or Arminian, they're very similar in this area where they reason toward God by means of the via negativa, the via eminentia. They're, they're very similar reasoning toward God apart from God's self-revelation. The question is, in that environment, with that approach, to the attributes of God. How is scripture going to function as your authority? Mm -hmm. In another couple of sessions, I'm going to refer to, I'm going to describe for you what I call the web of Thomas. Web of Thomism, depending on how the best way to pronounce it.
pronounce it, but Thomas Aquinas and the particular understanding of the transcendence of God that he had. Very good example of the via eminentia, the, the, the reasoning toward God by ascribing the best that you know of to God and better. Because your philosophical presuppositions, your worldview presuppositions are injected into that process. How is scripture going to function as an authority there? Mm -hmm. And I think that some errors crept into our theology proper as a result of that. From the medieval tradition, uh, from the Reformation tradition, as you know, as represented by uh, the, the theology that treated the systematic theology like a science, uh, which is many of the ones that we love and and use. Okay. It's a very important question. How is scripture supposed to function authoritatively in that kind of an environment? What we need to do instead is focus on the progressive self-revelation of God. Instead of the creature reasoning toward the creator, it's the creature reasoning about the creator's self-revelation. Yeah. It's not just that we... But you see what he's saying? It's 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 his revelation. Right. It's his revelation, not our revelation. We're not putting things. Holding. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Scott. Fifty-six. Old man. Okay. Yeah. So when we understand that we've got we got twenty-four, fifty-six years of. I don't know how long you've been. And let's just say that you started yesterday, and you you got your perspectives putting it into this Bible. You know what I'm saying? That you have a lot of baggage that you want to lay on God, and you start morphing the word instead of God coming and you go and you start reading from it. And you go, oh, this is what he's talking about. This is what Christ like, like behavior is. This is what this first Corinthians 13. This is what love really is. This is what agape sacrificial love is. And you start you start understanding that it's not from our perspective, it's from his. I think what time is our class in? Uh you got 15 minutes. Okay. All right. So we got a little late start. So well, all right. Well, probably won't get too incommunicable, but I just want to so Go it's ahead. not the creature reasoning to the creator. Yeah, that's it's the creature reasoning out of the creator's revelation. It is him it's bringing it to us reason. and not us bringing it to him. So not exegetical reasoning toward the creator. Yes, we're we're I see Jesus is us moving and injecting our, our views into right. God. That's I see Jesus. Exegetical is his revelation. Going in, uh, okay. You see it? Yeah. It, 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 and see there, when we start understanding, okay, all right, well, the scripture says God is love. Yeah. Okay, we we'll understand what love means according to scripture mm -hmm. and not what mm -hmm. some pastor at some church or some right, elevation right. church or some whatever. What is, that, what is that verse? Uh, second Corinthians. No, no, the love verse. First John. First John or Second Corinthians? There's Second Corinthians one too, I think. Really? I see. Yeah. One Man thing. has a tattoo on the phone. <laughs> it's a. Uh... I know John talks about it, but anyways, we got we got a few things. Yeah, no problem. But here, find out what virtues are. And then inflate them to the infinite degree and ascribe it to God. We begin by understanding what God describes as virtue. See, and there, there's where you say that's what God that's describes. God. The other way is. is difference? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, maybe I'll go back after our discussion of the attributes of God and sort of uh, review this section again. And uh, I think it'll become clear. It'll become clear as we go. Especially as we talk about the attributes of God's transcendence. Like each and every. Yeah, I just swear I feel a little drop. Okay. Yeah, man, do what you need. I was like, why do I feel drops? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why that's that's like. Oh, I see now. I don't know where the good one is, but this is gross. It still works. I thought you had a bowl. I thought you said go get the bowl. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go get the whole thing. Hey, man, I'm from a chintzy uh, homeless shelter as well, dude. I'm cool with that. <laughs> okay. I'm from Lake County. Usually our roots don't hold about how we yeah. feel about thinking about the attributes of God. Here, this is how we approach the task of describing God. You can't do this flippantly, guys. You can't just assume that you're doing the right thing, that you've got the right method. It's something you got to think about. Okay. And he goes on to talk about reading scripture from a human from the standpoint of looking at God. All right. We, we need to look from God. From scripture, you understand from down, not up, not down, up, but up, down. So that's reading into it bad. So when somebody you hear a pastor and even question, because I, I think my favorite thing uh, uh, Seeber did is when he came to the mission, he said, I'm not here to tell you, to tell you what scripture says. I'm here to give you the tools so you can find out what scripture says. Yeah. Okay. And so I want to tell you this too. Question everybody. Okay, question everybody. Don't be paranoid about it and say you're wrong. And don't be arrogant about it when you got something. But question everyone. When you hear even your own pastor say something and it doesn't stick right with you, seek it out. Seek it out. And then confront them with it and say, hey, this, am I reading this correctly? Make sure that you, uh, you interpret. And this is what draws us closer to God is when we diligently seek him. Seek him. Not somebody else telling us. Mm. That's when, that's when we, we start getting this beautiful relationship. That's when it starts growing. Okay. All right. So this, I've introduced a with proper interpretation. We understand that he is beyond infinite, holy, other than okay, but he does come to us in a understanding. We're gonna he does tell us through scripture. God describes us having body parts. And these are all scriptures, and it's in your book. You'll find them in your book, okay? Or you'll find them in the book where God is talking about it. He has fates, accountants, eyelids, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. And these are, you see what he, he really he comes across as uh, personal. But, but the question is, and people will address it, if God is indivisible, if he's not made up of any parts, if he is spiritual and, and uh, uh, corporal, how can he have parts? He goes on and he says, God describes himself by his own creation. Okay, that he is he's a lamb, an eagle. He's even in Matthew talks about he's a hen. You know, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you together as as a as a mother hen gathers her brood. He even describes himself as a hen. But if he is the creator. How can he be the cre creation? Then he describes the human experiences, actions, emotions, mm -hmm. and our senses, even our senses. He, he talks about tasting. And there's remembering, judging. He's, he's a man of war. He's not even a man of war. He's, he's mm -hmm. huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he sees joy, grief, hatred. But if he is other than us and beyond us, and we're gonna, we might, I'm probably not gonna have time to do that. Impassibility is another, like pure actuality. You remember what he said about pure actuality? Well, there's another one called impassibility, but we're probably not gonna get to that one. But, anyways, if he is omniscient, if he's pure actuality, if he's considered, how can all this be? God conveys himself in a personal way for us to understand him. And Seifert's touched on it last week, and this is the big word right here. Anthropomorphic language. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, anthropomorphic language is just a more form shape change. Yep. Yeah. Is God forming a way to speak to us according to the way that we understand? Mm -hmm. yeah. So he it makes it more personal to know that he he understands that we see, we hear, that we need to run to a stronghold. We we need to be gathered together, that we we're all these beautiful him trying to be, make it not just this lofty God sitting on his throne high, but down here inside of us, making it personal that he is with us and through us and for us. And then, this no, is what the ultimate. I, go ahead, man. Do it. The, the ultimate. So anthropomorphic language and and 
would it be accurate to say that his ultimate expression of that would be Christ himself? Ah, yeah, in mm -hmm. flesh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a very example, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Yeah, I mean, it's a very example of what we're supposed to be. And that's what I'm saying when I'm talking about the holiness and do proper interpretation to understand what that means. But God on ground, foot on ground, walking on this earth to be the very example of that sacrificial uh, obedience that God asks us to have. He, he gives us and conveys it in a way that we understand. That he's not a, a chicken, okay? He, he's not a lion. He's not creature, okay? And there's a pan on his all. See, well, there's, there. Be careful on that one because yeah. there's there's a what, p a n uh, p a n e pantheus. Anyways, it says God is everything and in everything. Yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. He is, God is the tree and he's that door. And, yeah, I think it's pantheus. Pantheus, pantheus. pantheus. There's a lot of gods, right? Oh no, that's yeah. There's a it's an. Anyways, it's right there. Yeah, you yeah. understand what I'm saying. That God, and God is trees. God is, God is a druid. everything. He's in everything. He's, He's druids. Yeah. Use that. Uh, that's where astro astrological signs and wonder, you know, all this stuff. But anyway, so all scripture says about God uses anthropomorphic language. That is language that, that speaks of God in human terms or in terms we know and understand. In a broader sense, if God is going to teach us about the things we need to know, no, we do not know by direct experience, such as his attributes, he has to teach us in terms of what we know. Right. Okay? So he, he has to give us examples, and he uses us. Have you, ever been, have you ever been praying about something, or are you talking to somebody about something, and you, you say something, and you realize that he just used you? Yeah. To say what you what you needed to hear, huh. <laughs> all the time. I've but, done that. But through your yeah. own voice, yeah. you know what I'm saying. Yeah. But I'm, I, that's not really anthropomorphic. Good. But I'm just saying, any means, any means. And you will even use your own voice and your own breath and your own. You're just rambling on about something to actually, yeah, crazy that. I just, I just, I just and people just let you go. And he, yeah, you yeah. go. Do you know what he just did? And you're yeah. like, they're like. Yeah, man. <laughs> get it out, man. Calm down, man. Calm down. All right, so we got six minutes. Ah, my last one. All right, we're gonna. He, he touches on it, but we went through. I, I tried to touch on this before. Okay, and so we only have like a few more minutes, so I'm just gonna um communicable uh, attributes, and um these are um he he these are ones. That God tries to relate is anthropomorphic. Okay, there's two different types. And Andy Schneider, he sort of goes, he goes, God doesn't categorize his attributes. He does not categorize. So he doesn't, Schneider puts up, Dr. Schneider puts it, he goes, I don't think we should put it in categories because God doesn't do it. Well, then he goes on to put it in two different categories of his own of transcendence. <laughs> and you go, well, what you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyways, so, but he goes, if you're going to do it, this is a good one to do it, okay? And what this means is that there's two different categories um, that we can put that's more relatable, the more that we understand God in a, in a, he is love, he is justice, we know what love, we know what justice is, he is merciful, we can be merciful, we know what that is, so he relates it in the communicable attributes, communicates attributes through uh using us okay so we understand what it is remember it's other than it's beyond us okay his is the very perfection and standard by which all these stem from but there's certain ones that we cannot understand well, we can get to understand and that's what i was trying to get at last time there's omniscience and that's all powerful we can't ever grasp that but we like power so we understand it's a finite view of that a finite um, he is, um, uh, well, he's ever present, but we, we can't be everywhere at once. I can be on a phone and on a laptop and screaming at somebody down the hallway, but I'm not every place at one time. Okay. But he, he relates with this, another one. And I wanted us to get, get time. So these are, these are the non-communicable versus communicable. 
the okay. ones that he relates to. And if you go through there, you can go, okay, well, I see what we change. Immutable means that he's unchangeable. He never changes. Yeah. Okay. So a love with all proper interpretation, we can understand what his love is. Omniscience, omnipotent. Self-existence is one that is another one that's other. Okay. It means that he is self, uh, uh, he doesn't need air, food. He's always been. He's pure actuality. He's actually ever, ever uh, lasting. So what's, you, what's up, brother? These are still attributes, right? Some of them. Some. Are. Some, but what I want us to see was the difference between the two different types. You can go through and go, um, communicable, no, 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 yeah, no, rather like yeah. they're all they're all right? Yes, 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 yes. Is it, is it like we can partake in mercy and holiness and justice, but not? On, on the on the center on the ground. No, we can't, we can, yeah. We just can't. We, we can't get it. We share his righteousness and love. Yeah. I say some things we can, but some things we can't. Yes. Yeah, yes. I see that. I see that. Okay. And then why this is important? There's a theology out there that talks about us being little Jews, little G gods. Yeah. Be careful about that. Yeah. That's what they did in the garden. You can be like. That's what Satan did. That's what Satan. He tempted uh, uh, even Adam with. You know, you. He's just afraid that you can be like. We could be like him if we don't believe. Now we're not. We're not. And there is even a preacher out there that says that um, we are uh, uh, we have the same DNA as, DNA as Jesus, and we could have done what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, uh, White. Oh, White. <laughs> Todd White and uh, in Copeland. Yeah, You're Kevin yeah. Copeland. Uh, All yeah. right. So what I presented to you today is the just a very brief look at a. Infinite and personal God. And this is on page 60, 167 in systematic theology. God is both infinite and personal. He is infinite that in that he is not subject to any of the limitations of humanity or the creation in general. He is far greater than everything he has made, far greater than everything else that exists. But he is also personal. He interacts with, with us as a person, anthropomorphic language. And we can relate to him as persons. We can pray to him, worship him, obey him, and he can speak to us, rejoice in us, and love us. Mm -hmm. This is the God of the Bible. This is a God that if we do our proper interpretations, if we take the time, and it's just how, how much, how far you want to go. It's how far you'll take it. And I, I, I'm going to drive this home, man. I was talking with Paul before all this, man. Four years ago, not even four years ago, I was, I was a dope fiend. Um, 26, 26 years ended on my uh, crank addiction, 35 years of pothead, booze, psychosis, looking for my next sack. Choked my mom, did all these things. I diligently seeking them out. In August, I get, I get my own church. I get ordained May 13th. Thank God. Man. Yeah, so what I'm saying God, is what you, how far are you willing to put it out there for? Mm -hmm. And it, See, first kingdom of heaven, you're doing it right now. Yeah. You're doing it right now. You, you got a year off. But you get to see first kingdom of heaven, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of it. Okay, okay guys? All right. You want to pray, Paul? Pray, Paul. Thank you, brother. Father God, we thank you for the work that you're doing um, mm -hmm. in Chris's life, Lord, but ours, uh, mm -hmm. just in this world, we um, amazed by your presence, by your working. Um, by who you are, Lord, we thank you for that to have the chance to learn more about you and yeah. to you as we continue to learn. So, thank you for that opportunity, God. Thank you for the grace and grace you showed us. And uh, just ask you just to go forward in our day that you would uh, give us opportunities to uh, share that joy that you give us. Amen. Uh, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Christ's name. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, man. Yeah, I shared it with David Seaford. So I'm actually in a small group of church, and people keep asking about systematic theology.